We're constantly being told to do our bit for the planet. You have the power to make a difference from the moment you wake up. We all have to reduce carbon emissions from our lives. Ten ways that you can reduce your carbon footprint. Your carbon footprint. Your carbon footprint. Your carbon footprint. And even the people extracting the fossil fuels are telling us how we can play our part. But should I feel guilty about my carbon footprint? Or is this push for personal sacrifices just a distraction from real climate solutions? I lead a pretty low-carbon life. But I also live in Germany, one of the richest and biggest contributors to global warming. Even with that frugal lifestyle, my emissions are still well above the global average. And there's only so much I can do to live greener. So why is everybody trying so hard to make me feel guilty about my personal carbon footprint? And does anything I do to live green actually make a difference? Let's start with how people became obsessed with the idea of carbon footprints. And, of course, how to shrink them. In the mid-1990s, two Canadian researchers came up with the term ecological footprint as a metaphor for all of humanity's impact on the planet. A decade later, this academic concept was picked up by one of the biggest oil companies in the world, British Petroleum. BP made a calculator that let anybody work out their own carbon footprint. And they made sure people knew about it. They took out whole-page adverts in newspapers like the New York Times. They ran commercials on TV. What size is your carbon footprint? And they stuck posters on billboards in airports around the world. Now, oil companies like BP and ExxonMobil had known for decades that burning their products was heating the atmosphere and warping the climate. And at first, the industry tried to deny the science. But then they changed tactics. As the public and policy makers began to wake up to the climate crisis, um, Exxon and the rest of the fossil fuel industry gradually began to, re to shift uh, their propaganda from that outright blatant climate denial of the recent past to a more subtle and insidious form of lobbying and propaganda. This is Harvard University researcher Jeffrey Suprin, who studies how fossil fuel companies have misled the public on climate change. The very notion of a carbon footprint was first popularized by oil giant BP as part of a $100 million per year marketing campaign. Suprin said the fossil fuel industry tapped into a culture of extreme individualism, particularly in the US, and manipulated those values. The footprint literally personifies um, greenhouse gas emissions. It brings it down to the scale of a human footprint. And in doing so, in talking about the company's footprint the same way you talk about a person's, uh, it levels the playing field in a way that's misrepresentative of, of the true uh, nature of the climate challenge. By talking about what you and I can do, companies take the pressure off themselves. And it's an idea with a long history in the murky world of public relations. Take these adverts from an environmental nonprofit group in the 1970s called Keep America Beautiful. Some people have a deep abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. The Italian-American actor pretending to be an indigenous man isn't the only dodgy thing going on here. The Keep America Beautiful campaign is funded by the same multinational corporations churning out plastic bottles, companies like Coca-Cola and plastic industry lobby groups. They had found a way to shift the burden of responsibility onto the people buying their products while still looking like they cared about the environment. Daddy, you forgot. Every little bit hurts. The plastic industry wasn't the only one doing this. Researchers have also shown that oil company ExxonMobil mimicked PR tactics used by Big Tobacco to dump responsibility onto their customers. Just look at the words they use. In private, ExxonMobil accepts climate changes caused by fossil fuels. But in public, they talk about consumers and meeting energy demand. Privately, they blame climate change on CO2 emissions. But publicly, they focus on all greenhouse gases without saying what that means for their own fossil fuel production. And instead of talking about the reality of the climate that they've already changed, they downplay it as a risk, potential risk, long-term risk, or potential long-term risk. That last tactic of emphasizing uncertainty comes straight out of the tobacco industry's handbook, literally. 
The thing is, these industries are all in the same bind. They want to sell a product that kills. And one tactic the tobacco companies perfected was downplaying the risks while talking up personal choice. As early as the 1920s, tobacco companies were building advertising campaigns around the idea of an individual's freedom to choose. And this caught on in media too. Researchers found the number of news articles framed this way shot up through the 1970s and 80s. But when tobacco companies got taken to court for harming people's health, they flipped the narrative and argued it was the smoker's fault for buying their cigarettes. Choice turned from a symbol of freedom into a tool of blame. It's a similar story for fossil fuel companies. They've argued for a long time that they aren't responsible for the emissions from burning their product. By selling products like these, we can help our customers reduce their carbon footprint. The idea that people bear more responsibility for climate change than companies is a greenwashing narrative that has grown popular. A global poll in 2020 found that most people want the government to act first on climate change, but then said consumers have a greater responsibility than companies. So why exactly is big oil so desperate to get us talking about our personal responsibility? To take the focus off them and to put the focus back on us so that we start feeling guilty about what can I do? This is Emily Atkin, an American journalist who runs a newsletter about climate change and the fossil fuel industry. The reason that fossil fuel companies do so much PR, the reason that they tweet, the reason that you see billboards everywhere is because it's extremely important to them to have social license to operate. If they are deprived of the public's trust and love, then they are more vulnerable to regulation. Uh, They're more vulnerable to not existing. But this strategy has started to backfire. In October 2019, BP tweeted that the first step to reducing your emissions is to know where you stand. Find out your carbon footprint with a new calculator and share your pledge today. But this time the public pushed back. People are just tired of being misled and being manipulated while the world burns around them. So how big are their carbon footprints? And don't they feel a bit hypocritical about passing the blame onto consumers? We asked three of the biggest fossil fuel companies. BP didn't respond at all and the others didn't directly answer our questions. Shell said it wants to get to net zero emissions by 2050. It said that tackling climate change needs to be a joint effort of energy producers, governments, and those who use energy, including private, commercial, and industrial consumers. ExxonMobil said it's committed to working to decarbonize high-emitting sectors through investments to develop and deploy technologies that will help society achieve a net zero future. It's said that changes in society's energy use, coupled with the development and deployment of affordable lower emission technologies, will be required to drive meaningful emissions reductions. But these companies are lobbying against climate action while extracting millions of barrels of oil from the ground every single day. The four biggest private energy companies are responsible for 11% of the CO2 and methane emissions from burning fossil fuels since 1965. Add in state-owned companies in Saudi Arabia, Russia and Iran, And together, these seven companies are responsible for 20% of emissions. And the biggest 20 companies? One third of emissions. You and I contribute relatively little to the climate crisis. Um, Our personal carbon footprints don't actually matter that much in the grand scheme of climate change. This feeling is widely echoed. A similar statistic that 100 companies are responsible for 71% of emissions has become a viral rallying cry for people arguing that personal action is useless. And this is where most people stop. But our personal responsibility is more complicated than that. The numbers we calculated earlier include emissions from fossil fuels burned by the customers of these companies. That's all of us. Businesses, governments, NGOs, and yes, individual people like you and me. And so the question is, How much difference do our personal sacrifices actually make? The International Energy Agency projects that 40% of emissions cuts needed to decarbonize by 2050 will come from things like making more electricity from renewable energy or using cleaner technologies in industry. That takes public support, but you and I can't do much about it. A measly 4% of the emissions cuts are going to come from personal actions to reduce energy demand, like flying less, walking to work and turning off lights. These are things that can be made easier by policy, but can still happen without it. 
The remaining 55% comes from changes that need a mix of government action and active consumer choices. That means buying an electric car, installing a heat pump, or better insulating your home. And it's not enough for everybody to just buy an electric car. Policymakers also need to build enough charging stations for them to work. Without subsidies to make your home more sustainable, many people can't afford to install a heat pump. Now, there's a blurred line between which changes count as purely personal and which count as mixed. But that's exactly what experts tell us. Every action you take has a bigger impact on society than just shrinking your own individual carbon footprint. Either we face up to the fact that we are going to have to live differently or, or we fail. This is Stuart Capstick from the Centre for Climate Change and Social Transformation at the University of Cardiff. His research has shown something that's actually kind of promising, that individual and systemic change are often two sides of the same coin. Take the rise of vegan meat products. Now that hasn't just happened, it's happened because people took it upon themselves to, to try to eat uh, more plant-based food. As a result, marketers, manufacturers, supermarkets have made more food available, which means more people then buy that food, you know, it becomes part of a sort of snowballing um, change. And this feedback loop can also work the other way around. If governments stop subsidising fossil fuels and invest money in public transport or cycle paths, it can make it cheaper and easier for an individual to choose not to drive a car. And that can inspire more people to cycle and put pressure on politicians. If I am one of the people getting on my bike, I am contributing to that changing social context. And so I, in, my, in my own small way, I make it more feasible, more normal to cycle. Experts say some of the biggest personal actions you can take are just using your voice, writing to your local politician, voting, talking to friends and raising awareness. But it's clear that consumer choices have an impact too, particularly in rich countries where people on average salaries still fall within the top 10% of emitters. People will say, I'm a drop in the ocean. It's the system that needs to change. It's the economy, etc." Well, my response to that is, how is that system going to change? But systems don't change unless people push for them to change. Just because fossil fuel companies are guilting us about our own carbon footprints doesn't actually mean that we're off the hook. So what's the biggest change that you've made for the climate? Let us know in the comments below.